For us, the limestone layers, the, the brown stuff at the bottom, and then you hit the gray shale layers. So that's what we're after, the gray shale. <clears throat> and this is a view of uh, the pit at one point. And the, the layer actually comes up usually in one to three or four inch thick layers, really flat layers. So we expose the layer, you wash it down with a hose to see what's on the surface, peel it up, wash the bottom, wash the top of the one underneath it, just keep doing this all the way down through the layer. You can see big debris piles in the background there. Here's another view of it. You can see it'll get a little sense of the, uh, how it's layered. You can see kind of that stair step on some of the gray layer there. And then you know that I have that little arrow going down to a bioherm. Uh, we occasionally run into these huge bioherms. And these are probably bryozoa, algae, coral uh, communities. And some of them will be three, four feet in diameter and uh, several feet tall. And they're hard to dig around. Um, but at the base of the museum, you're going to find hundreds of whatever. Primary cups, gastropods, brachiopods, they're all piled up against it, like if they were all washed in there, just piled up against it. So it's really a gold mine when you get a hold of one of these, you know, around the base of the pile up. <clears throat> the pit now is collected by a guy, Ken Carnes from Columbus, uh, who found the one complete one I've ever seen. From that, one. So that was a really good day for him. <coughs> So complete crinoids and trilobites is what we're after, uh, but they're just not very many complete ones. We find lots of partials, <coughs> trilobite molds, you know, missing a cheek. But when we find one, they're really good. Uh, lots of other common fun, you find lots of crinoid cups and crinoid hold fasts. Uh, hold fasts, they're just all over the nest. Some of these layers are just all over the floor for it. So you look at the rocks all cutting them out all day long. You got to push <coughs> those things. Large gastropods, brachiopods, and then the bioworms. <clears throat> Another Indiana site, Oldenburg, uh, some of you may be familiar with. It's a creek flowing through a farmer's property. Um, it's been collected on and off depending upon the mood of the farmer. You know, often you know, 20 or 40 bucks helped his mood a lot. In other days, he, was, he just wouldn't let us collect it all. So, but then Dan Cooper did get uh, collecting rights to it a couple of times. And so we've done a lot of collecting there. Now, since it is next to the creek, definitely got a major water problem. And this is just a view of the uh, shale layers and just up close to what we're actually after. And it's right at creek level. So you're going to be down in the water no matter what you do. So what you do is you build up a wall of debris behind you to steer the water away from where we're collecting. We're collecting on the left-hand side on that wall. And you find isotelis. This is you know, partial or a busted up one as collected. So then you collect all, all the pieces and put it back together. Big jigsaw puzzle. But they're worth it when they're done. And uh, do get very large ones there, uh, up to a foot. It's not centimeters, is it? No, it's not centimeters. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, plexicaline, the closer view of one. And they get uh, an inch and three quarter, uh, sometimes pushing two inches. So pretty good size trilobites. So plexicaline, <clears throat> ice telus, uh, trilobites can be pretty sparse. Every now and then you run into a pocket, and uh, quickly, but usually it was one or two a day, but we were, all, we were collecting them because we are after the big, big guys. Mostly prone, a few of them are rolled up. Sometimes the flexicalities are going to be really hard nodules, so if you found this hard nodule, you crack them all over, this might be a problem on your side. And then uh, Ampelicious uh, can be found here. I have a picture of one down there in the corner. Uh, I found uh, one there. Uh, didn't survive extraction from the hill, but maybe a dozen have been found over the years. So, reasonable chance of finding one. Then the uh, Mount Orb, Ohio site, which got named Cooper Creek by so many, um, and it was initially found because uh, people were walking the trees and found the roll of Flex Calvin eroding out of the hillside. So, the first one that I know to collect it was Ken Pony. 
when he used to be a member of the dry dredgers. He passed away over years ago, but uh, he collected every creek in this area. And he knew where all the trouble lights were. And so he told Dan Cooper, and so Dan leased uh, a small portion of the property to do a test dig, found that there were a lot of trawl lights, pretty good density, so we bought five acres of the property. About 15 years later, I bought it from him, and so I still have it. And we're still actively collecting there. <clears throat> so this is what it looks like. Um, you know, we have to take off a lot of ore burden to get down to the layer because the, the hillside kind of slopes up though. So each dig is deeper and deeper in. The big problem with taking that much overburden off is where you put it. So we created a new hill <coughs> where you put all the uh, extra dirt. But then when you're finally done, you've got this nice, dry, flat area to dig and a nice, big, open drainage ditch. Always love to collect it the first few days after we open it up because it's, that's pristine condition. <coughs> Another picture of it. I think that's actually me there on the tarp. Um, another picture, the, the big problem is getting rid of the, the, the junk. So you have to push it up against that opposite wall to keep your drainage ditch open. <coughs> and we always leave a little bit of uh, overburden on top of it and then dig down to it. And when you get to this bracketal layer, that's where the trouble might start. This bracketal layer on down for about two feet. And this requires, uh, a fresh layer, requires wedges and sledgehammer to get it going. Now when the layer has been weathered for a long time, like sitting over the winter, then you can do just simple hand tools. But when it's fresh, you've got to do some good <coughs> stuff. This is going to break out some pretty good sized chunks. Check all the edges, of course, with the control bites. And go down, uh, usually we do it in three steps. Go down the bottom. Taking the whole thing would be just too much. It'd be just too hard to get it all at once. Now, a lot of field trips have been out to this site. Uh, the drivers has been out there, I don't know, probably a dozen times over the years. Um, the MAPS organization out of Illinois, which is a much bigger club, uh, they've been out there a couple of times. It's chaos when they're all there. There's about 100 of them. Um, this, I don't know which group this is, but another group that's been out there. But this is what happens when it rains real hard. The creek backs up and floods the whole layer. Now here it's, I don't know, it might be five or six feet deep, uh, judging by the back wall there. But I saw one time where the water was so deep that it was flowing over that back woods and into the woods <laughs> and carrying rocks with it. Um, so then it takes maybe three days before the water comes back down and you can collect again. Of course, the problem with that is then you got mud everywhere. So with mud on top of all you see all that brown stuff on top of what used to be gray shell layer. So, and the uh, drainage ditch gets a little bit thinner because now you're shoveling all the mud onto the side too. But there's still lots of trail lights in there. And then eventually as we usually get to the end of the day and there's been a number of rainstorms, a lot of mud has come in, the, the water channel gets narrower and narrower, but we gotta keep it open, keep the water flowing out. Of course, we find lots of flexicalamine in there. Lots of rolled up ones, lots of prone ones, about a one to one ratio of rolled up and prone. And isotelus, which usually peel, so you can put them back together. Again, the jigsaw puzzle, but again, they're, they're worth it. I don't know what size this one is, it's probably a four or five inch. The biggest one I found at uh, the site has been 10 inches. So they do get pretty large. And of course, roll up ice steels. Get more of those in the contents. And one handful of ashes. All the time. So this place has been collected for 20 years. Only one of the ashes. Don, how many fossil, how many trial bikes have come out? Or what's it's the guess? Coming out of the next, oh, I think it's the next slide. Yeah. 25,000 flexes. In the years of the day. And that's a rough estimate, but that's. Probably in the ballpark. A uh, few of them are multiples, but usually it's single specimens. And a lot of them are inflated specimens. So we don't get a lot of squashed ones, pushed ones. They're usually pretty nicely inflated trail bites. 
And other fauna you'll be gastropods, occasional crinoids, practicals, rhizome, really large cephalopods up to three feet long. And when you find a cephalopod that big in the layer, there's no polyps anywhere. They were either eaten or scared away. Uh, but then usually what happens, you go to the next cut, and there'll be more childless than usual in there. So it's kind of like they all ran away from the cephalopod. Then we occasionally hit these thick, limey lenses um, in the shale, and those have been totally barren. So they come and they go. It's still 25,000 trilobites. Okay, the last site I'll talk about is uh, Russian New York. This is what's been called the uh, Walcott Rust Quarry. Uh, it's creek exposure. It was first collected back in the 1800s by Charles Walcott and William Rust. Uh, and it's a fine-grained uh, mudstone. And it must be a very rapid burial of the trilobites because the trilobites are beautifully preserved. Complete, three-dimensional, and there's not very much junk in it. I would say probably 75% of the trilobites you find there are complete. It's not like here where you find tails and body segments and heads. These are really high percentage of complete trilobites. Now Walcott uh, got into uh, studying the trilobites there. He, he did a lot of thin sections of trilobites to look for the appendages and other soft body parts of the trilobites. At that time, no one had actually proven that they Trilobites had appendages, and he found that the appendages were still preserved inside these rocks. Uh, now he thin sectioned hundreds of trilobites to do this. Now, as a collector, that really hurts to think about hundreds of trilobites being cut into little pieces, but that's what it took to do the studies. So he published all that work, and um, it was quite a sensation in the trilobite world. And a large collection ended up at Harvard. Then Walcott went on to discover the Burgess Shale and a bunch of other Cambrian exposures out west of Canada. So uh, quite an accomplished guy. He was an amateur turned professional and uh, really made a name for himself. Now Walcott last collected there in the early 1900s and then the site kind of, you know, people still knew about it. They went up there and they poked around, but no one really did a serious day for a long time. In 1970, a guy in New York, Tom Whiteley, reopened the site, at least it reopened it, uh, to do a, another serious dig uh, to study it. And that work ended up getting published in collaboration with some professionals. And again, a lot of the specimens ended up at Harvard. And then the site again went kind of dormant. And then Dan Cooper uh, asked Tom if he was done. And Tom said yes, and so Dan was the site along with his son, Jason, and a friend, Jay. And uh, they've been collecting it since 2007. Now, this is a picture of the original Walcott Rust dig in, uh, let me see. It's hard to see, it's open. But you can see kind of this trench running down through here. That's the division between the, the layer up in the wall and their, their debris pile back here. They were doing this with pretty crude hand tools back then. Um, but I would imagine that the layer was pretty thin. It probably sloped down, so they could probably get some stuff pretty easily. They got deeper into the wall and just got too hard to do by hand. Because they didn't have bulldozers back then. So this was the Tom Wiley dig. It was hard to even see it. But you could see a few, few rocks of the, of the layer sticking out on the surface. Otherwise, it was completely overgrown and uh, probably filled up with mud that washed down from the top of the hill. Because this is at the bottom of a pretty steep hill coming down to this valley. So Dan got a piece of equipment in there and started clearing away all the debris to find the layer. And you can start to see on the left-hand side there some of the gray layers starting to poke through. And so then you just got to keep cleaning it out, get all the crap out of there and start to find the layer, and eventually you find where the previous dig ended. So there's still wow. some, there's still some of the bottom layer is left right here, and then of course the uh, layers above it. So that